It's my pleasure to introduce one of our keynote speakers for the year two final project showcase, that is Blaise Aguera Iarcas. I uh, first met Blaise uh, over, uh, as I recall, over a video call, having been introduced by Kenrick McDowell, who's also a friend of Strelka. And rather immediately, as I recall, we got into the topic of synthetic language, uh, which is a thread that has run throughout our ongoing conversation over the years, that a thread that is eventuating in a co-authored piece currently under construction. Blaze, I, I am not shy to say, is one of the more interesting people that I know. Uh, and, and so is, like all such people, difficult to introduce um, because difficult to describe by definition. He is a, a genuine polymath, someone who can, and more importantly does, uh, explore the philosophical implications of neuroscience in the morning, uh, while also making sure that AI on billions of Android devices is doing what it should in the afternoon. What it should uh, should also include, as he would have it, uh, federated learning, a vision for AI that is anonymized, decentralized, uh, secure, and in many important ways, more robust and scalable um, than, the, than, um, uh, than that, that which we currently have, a vision that has um, influenced in both directly and indirectly some of the projects that we've worked on um, over the years uh, at, at Strelka. Um, so I will with that, I'll simply say that Blaze is a um, he's also a VP and fellow at Google Research, where he leads a 600-person-plus uh, team uh, organized, working on both basic research and new project, new products and projects uh, with uh, based on on artificial intelligence. There, Blaze is also a dear friend, um, and couldn't be more happy to have him join us and give his thoughts on what's at stake. Um, for synthetic intelligence, uh, terraforming, and specifically artificial language, uh, something that you will see come up in a number of the projects for the second year. Thank you, Benjamin. That, that's an incredibly kind introduction. Uh, so I, I'm going to dive right in since uh, I, I want to try and keep uh, somewhat close to to my to my time limit. Um, I'm assuming that you all can see and that and that that the title slide is not obstructed by stuff. Um, Synthetic intelligence and language, and uh, this relates to to uh, work that, as Benjamin mentioned, where we've actually been doing uh, together and 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 hope to uh, publish together sometime soon. Uh, so I'd like to talk about three things. First, the question of what is a who, and uh, then what happens when everything becomes a who, and uh, and thence the politics of planetarity, uh, a, a politics of a lot more who's than uh, than just. Um, us, us humans. So um, this is a little book that um, uh, that was written in 1747 by Julien Offre de Lemaitre, uh, who was an Enlightenment materialist, uh, and uh, it's called L'homme machine, man, man the machine. Uh, it was a logical extension of Descartes. Um, Descartes held that our bodies are machines, um, uh, bit machine, and uh, uh, Lemaitre extended this to the idea that we ourselves, like animals, are are machines, body and mind as well. Uh, this was uh, informed, I think, by his experience as a physician on the battlefield. He saw uh, probably uh, traumatic brain injuries and things. Uh, and and having, you know, when one sees traumatic brain injuries, uh, I think it's it's difficult to come away with the impression that that there is uh, some kind of soul that is not, you know, somehow the brain. And um, uh, and, and that, that was the conclusion that he reached. He published it anonymously, of course, when it was discovered that, that, that he was the one who wrote it. He got into a lot of trouble and got run out of town. Um, and uh, the book is, is very small and it's designed to be kind of hidden in a coat pocket. Now, um, there's there's been this sort of narrative of emergentism about, uh, about what minds might be uh, that tries to reconcile neuroscience with, um, uh, you know, with this feeling that we've all got that, that, that consciousness is something that isn't just about, you know, the execution of a machine. Um, but this idea that consciousness or awareness is, is somehow purely emergent, that it just kind of comes out of the, of, of the workings of the brain um, is problematic for a reason that Michael Graziano, I think, articulated quite well. Uh, so he's in, in the psychology department at Princeton, and he points out that, uh, you know, clearly there is a, an arrow A, a sense that, that our awareness springs from neuronal processing of information in the brain, but there also has to be an arrow B, 
wherein that awareness can in turn influence neurons that are actually firing in your head, because otherwise, how could you report on that experience? How could you talk about, um, about what, it, what it's like to be conscious? Um, and, um, you know, that, that ability to, to talk about consciousness, I mean, you know, maybe, uh, you know, there, there have been some neuroscientists, uh, Eccles comes to mind, who imagines that maybe there is literally a, a sort of spirit that can perturb neurons, uh, you know, or, or animate the ghost, but, but that starts to get pretty dicey. So, uh, so yeah, cat a cat for an hour would be uh, if you imagine that awareness is some kind of numinous thing that, uh, that is uh, separate from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the brain because otherwise it can't have any effect back. So mind, soul, self, consciousness, this belief that we all have that, you know, that we are who's uh, and can report and behave according to as well. Um, I mean, we don't know everything about the brain yet, obviously, but it sure looks like the brain is neural computation from end to end, like there isn't some mystical thing going on inside. And it's hard, uh, based on that, not to conclude that this idea of self or soul or, or whatever you want to call it, is really the way our brains model ourselves and model others, and that, that model is itself implemented neurally. So. Um, what that implies is that is that this idea of, of, of consciousness or selfhood is social and attentional. Uh, and um, Graziano's theory of, of consciousness is, is a social theory of consciousness. And, um, you know, he, he talks about it in terms of, of awareness of attention and imagines that that awareness of attention originated uh, potentially uh, as, as, a, uh, as a tool, as an, as an affordance for being able to model uh, your peers. Uh, you know, if you if you're um, um, uh, an, an ape in the troop and another ape is coming at you and is looking at you know is is attending to your knee which is injured, you might want to know that and you might want to try and use your imagination to understand what that um, what that other ape might be thinking as it's doing that because that will that will help you in a variety of ways. So um, so this idea that that consciousness is social first uh, is um, I think powerful. Um, theories of mind are, of course, useful. This is a classic illustration of, of theory of mind and, and how it hasn't all the way emerged in, in, in young children. Uh, you know, if, if you're on a phone with a small child and you say, you know, what are you doing? The, the child might say, playing with this, you know, if they're playing with an object. Of course, an adult won't say that because they will understand that the person on the other end of the phone can't see whatever the thing is that you're playing with. So you're going to have to describe it. And, uh, and that ability to sort of cast your, your own mind uh, into, uh, into the perspective of, of an other, of, of somebody different. That is, that is this kind of uh, uh, social modeling. Of course, once you have that ability, that ability to model the mind of another, this ability to model your own mind perhaps comes along as, as sort of an automatic byproduct of that. It, it certainly seems like, uh, like it would. Uh, so self-consciousness, you know, might be useful in its own right. Uh, the fact that we uh, that we have um, uh, attention and self-attention emerging as very, very powerful uh, mechanisms in artificial neural nets for uh, language models is probably relevant here. Uh, it, it probably does help in very concrete ways, but it also uh, it seems like something that would obviously happen uh, in a system that has learned how to model other intelligent systems. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure that you can draw a, a real uh, boundary around what is, you know, what is conscious and what is not conscious, but this is at least Graziano's idea of, of where consciousness uh, resides in the, in the tree or the bush, probably more accurately, of life. Um, what we do know is that starting about 7 million years ago, uh, the, the size of the brains of the things that became us started to explode very, very rapidly. Uh, actually, we've gone a little bit down from the peak right now of, of Neanderthals. They had slightly bigger brains than we do, um, but um, but that's um, uh, that's that's cranial capacity. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, over the last seven seven million years, this is where fire and where agriculture happened in that process. Robin Dunbar and his colleagues uh, in um, in 1998 uh, proposed the social brain hypothesis, uh, in which the size of the brain, the size of the cortex, is all about uh, the ability to model others. Uh, and um, and that of course brings with it the ability to um, uh, to work in larger peer groups uh, and engage in social bonding and ultimately to create a, a sort of social super organism, which um, Dunbar argues and I would argue as well is what makes us intelligent. It's not what we can do individually. It's the fact that we're able to work in large groups, um, not only uh, not only groups with individual recognition like the other great apes, but groups with anonymous recognition uh, like, uh, like 
uh, membership in cities or in companies or in, or in guilds or, in, um, uh, or, or with shared beliefs. Uh, Dunbar says, the evolution of unusually large brains in some groups of animals, no notably primates, has long been a puzzle. Although early explanations tended to emphasize the brain's role in sensory or technical competence, foraging skills, innovations, wayfinding, the balance of evidence now clearly favors the suggestion that it was the computational demands of living in large complex societies that selected for large brains. That was in uh, 2007, science. Uh, and I agree with this point of view. Now that results in a feedback loop, of course, because being effectively social requires modeling others um, but if those others are also getting smarter in order to model you, then a sort of arms race ensues. And, and that can result in exactly the sort of intelligence explosion that we see in the, in the increasing cephalization of, um, uh, of, of primates leading up to us. Same sort of thing happened with cetaceans, with whales, and in several other lineages. Now, this idea of attention schemas and theories of mind, which is to say sociality uh, as, as, the, as the origin of theories of mind, it isn't just within your own species. Uh, that also is useful. Uh, in an interspecies sort of setting, like uh, when, uh, when you are hunting or when you're being hunted. So it's not always cooperative. It can also be competitive. Uh, it can also be adversarial. Whether you're predator, prey, friend, enemy, potential mate, you know, you're always engaged in trying to predict the behavior of the other. That may be a matter of life and death in a predator and prey sort of situation or a matter of eating or not eating. So uh, it can be adversarial. And in some situations, it's, it's sort of adversarial even when, you, uh, when you're doing it within your own species. If we can be perfectly predicted, in other words, then that's kind of bad news. We don't like to be perfectly predicted. If you're the prey, you don't want to be perfectly predicted by the predator. If you're the predator, you don't want to be perfectly predicted by the prey. You want to remain surprising. Um, that's, uh, that's why, you know, if you're a rat, you don't like to be cornered, right? The idea of being cornered is that you're out of options. You don't have optionality. If you can be perfectly predicted, that's the same as being cornered. It means that whatever is doing the cornering uh, knows exactly what you're going to do next. And that's bad news. So suppose that you're a, a machine in some very general sense that has evolved uh, uh, to model and predict the behavior of other machines like you uh, and therefore yourself. So it's a bit of an arms race. You don't want to be predictable, but you also uh, don't want to be just you know, dumb or random uh, or suboptimal. So how do you do it? What are the tools that you bring to bear? Well, um, some animals with small brains use dynamical chaos and noise in order to do this. So you know, moths uh, you know, flap their wings in ways that, you know, that use physics to randomize their trajectories, and, and that, that makes them unpredictable. Um, also, a lot of animals, uh, including us, use uh, this idea of saddle points, I believe, uh, meaning that they put themselves in situations where they still have optionality uh, and they can kind of break either way. So that just a little nudge this way or that way can lead to different outcomes. Because uh, if you've committed yourself very early to one outcome or another, then you know, that, that, makes you, that makes you highly predictable. So staying close to these, uh, to these saddle points is important as well. And of course, if you, if you are able to use theory of mind, then, uh, then you use that theory of mind to avoid being, uh, being predictable as well. That's why uh, when we write, for instance, you know, we try to avoid using the same word twice you know, in, in, in one sentence and in the following sentence or something like that. We just intuitively don't want for our writing or for anything else that we do uh, for consumption by other intelligent beings to, uh, to be predictable. And we use memory uh, together with theory of mind to do that. That's expensive, of course, um, but this is also one of the reasons why uh, when you have, uh, for example, patients with anterograde amnesia, meaning they, they, they have sort of groundhog day, they forget everything immediately, why that can be so dehumanizing because you, you suddenly, you know, suddenly the sort of machinicity, if you want to think about it that way, of a person is exposed uh, because they're not, they're not able to sort of respond with, with novelty because they don't remember what they just did. So um, perhaps, and I would argue, uh, free will is what we call the gap between the reality of what our brains do and our ability to model it. Meaning, you know, we ourselves have a gap uh, between, between the models of, of, of ourselves, what we're going to do and what we actually do. And, and uh, free will is what we call that gap, I believe. And that's, and that's why we, uh, we, we put so much store in it. That's why we find it so important. The moment you're mechanical, like a program executing, you cease to be a who and you become an it. And conversely, the moment an it uh, becomes something that you model socially and that models you, perhaps that's the moment that it becomes a who. So uh, the implication is that free will and consciousness and personhood are actually relationships between A and B more than they are properties of A or B in isolation. 
uh, meaning, you know, if you could do the brain in a jar experiment somehow and, you know, take, you know, your entire brain and, and, and uh, implement it, you know, upload it somehow, which I, I don't believe we'll be able to do anytime soon, but imagine that you could, you put it in, into a computer and you kind of step through it, you know, it, you'll, it, it'll, it'll step through, uh, you know, a certain series of, of, of actions and things you can rewind, you can do it again. You know, if, if you, if you sort of rewind and do it again and again, like, a, like scratching a record or something, then, um, it, you know, you will not have the sense that you're interacting with a person. You will have the sense that you're just you're just playing out a program, and the, the difference, of course, is not in what is going on, but is in the relationship that you have to to that that brain in a jar in that moment. Now, um, I, I talked uh, last time about um, about the emerging uh, sort of uh, powerful surprisingness of large language models that um, that you know that really you know have this person like kind of uh, vibe. When you interact with them, they're uh, they're very surprising uh, and 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 a, and a very um, large step, I believe, toward artificial general intelligence. Uh, that's you know just just become possible in the last in the last couple of years. Um, this is a real dialogue that I mentioned in my in my earlier talk at the Strelka. Um, language models like this one, uh, which are trained you know with very very large uh, data sets from from the whole web, uh, certainly include the social modeling of humans uh, in a variety of ways. So. Um, that's that's interesting, and uh, and I think it's a bit of a threshold moment. Now, where will we see large language models like this one in the world in in the years that are uh, that are coming? Well, um, there was this paper in uh, in Nature just um, uh, just a week or so ago on, on the twenty first of July about a, a flexible uh, the first the first truly flexible thirty two bit. Our microprocessor. It's on the large side. I think it's almost a square centimeter, but um, it's uh, you know it's flexible and it can be it can be printed essentially on on, on anything you know on on a, on a milk carton or a what have you, um, and it has all of the basics. It has it has only uh, only a very small amount of RAM and ROM for the time being, but um, it's super cheap. It can be printed, um, and. Um, I, I would also note that you know there's there's uh, there's something interesting happening in 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 silicon nowadays, that, which is that um, we are seeing the uh, all of the major chip makers uh, recognize the importance of massively parallel vector and matrix and tensor operations uh, in their in their instruction sets, because those of course are the primitives that one uses to do neural computation in silicon. That's the way you implement um, uh, neural net computation, and. Um, and so what I'm seeing, if I had to guess, you know, where we'll be in a few years, we'll, we'll see lots of slower, uh, low power, you know, not super high clock rate, but massively parallel vector matrix and tensor operations orchestrated by very minimal risk cores uh, being produced cheaply and ubiquitously and being deployed everywhere in such a way that, you know, even though conventional computing might not, you know, sort of accelerate that much, that much more with respect to the usual sort of, uh, you know, Moore's law progression, uh, we will have the ability to run very large neural nets at very low power in many, many environments and very cheaply. Um, the, uh, um, the, the Verge article about, about this uh, flexible chip says, as ARMS researchers explain in their paper, this would all allow microchips to be put into all sorts of uses that would seem wasteful today. You might have chips printed into every milk bottle, for example, that detects spoilage, replacing the use of sell by dates. ARM says this will create a new internet of everything with chips integrated into more than a trillion inanimate objects over the next decade. Now, you know, when I see um, when I see sort of uh, news like this in, in The Verge, um, you know, part of me believes it, part of me is horrified because I, 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 I hate the idea of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of just the, you know, the, I don't know, the, the physical uh, waste and the uh, ubiquity of, of, of intelligent everythings. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly this, this kind of future implies that, that language, uh, which we now have neural nets, you know, that can do a very, very effective job of communicating with language, becomes the interface to everything. Uh, to everything that, uh, that that has any kind of of digital interface today, and probably many things that still don't have digital interfaces today. And um, with language, we have near universal human legibility, um, ability to command. Uh, we have something like a generic API uh, that uh, that that will you know essentially never go obsolete. Um, the ability to teach and to learn, uh, sociality and theory of mind. And also specificity of uh, of some kind of social norms, uh, you know, allegiance, intent, right? You you don't really get to have uh, you know a, a language model that is entirely neutral 
uh, it has some kind of affordances and it has some kind of a priming or purpose that it gets set up with uh, by its maker. So um, the politics of that becomes very, very interesting because now we're talking about a very large population uh, that includes humans and includes many, many other um, social actors uh, that, that use language uh, from the very large to the very tiny. Now, um, I used to follow this. Uh, uh, I, I don't follow very much on Twitter. I don't, I don't really use social media, but, but Internet of Shit was a pretty great um, uh, sort of a Twitter stream while it, while it lasted. Um, and um, it was about all of, the, uh, all of the lousy things that happen when you, um, as, as, they, as they put it, uh, put a chip in it, uh, whether that was um, juice makers or um, sex toys or coffee pots or uh, doorknobs or, uh, or, or various other things. Um, but this is the future <laughs> that, is, that is most definitely taking place. Um, a lot of, the, a lot of the, um, the sort of nastiness that comes from Internet of Shit uh, comes from bad design, from uh, very poor security, from um, uh, you know, bad ideas with respect to uh, how the internet gets used. Uh, you know, for example, juicer that doesn't work if it can't uh, you know, phone home to, to, its, to its maker. Uh, there are um, concerns about surveillance uh, and privacy and so on. But beneath all of that, beneath all of those issues that I think are, are soluble, um, there's also this, this issue of, um, of incentives and of alignment of incentives. So, you know, the, the juicer that, I, that, I, that I've been mentioning, uh, Juicero, which luckily the startup that was doing that, that thing uh, went, uh, went belly up. But, um, you know, the idea with Juicero was that, was that it's, you know, it's just a juicer, a, a, a fruit and vegetable juicer, but it would only juice um, packs of frozen uh, fruit or veg that, that the company would send you. So they were using sort of a razor blade model. And, um, <clears throat> and I think it would, it would refuse to juice it if um, you know, if when it scanned the the thing, either it it didn't it didn't match the DRM, you know, something that actually came from the company, or it was more than two weeks old. Uh, I believe that's right. Um, so you know, now you now you have sort of a you know a minimally intelligent thing that you know whose incentives are not necessarily aligned. Let's put it this way with those of the user, and we see various kinds of incentive misalignments of these sorts of things in the very minimally intelligent pieces of technology that um, that we have pervading our lives today. So what happens when entities with different kinds of goals interact? Well, um, it turns out that we, you know, we have um, we have some models for this. Um, actually, the the very first models of um, uh, of what now is known as as chaos theory uh, emerged from uh, population dynamics uh, the sorts of uh, simulations that um, that that often involve uh, either fluctuations of single populations or of multiple populations with either cooperative or adversarial relationships with each other, like the dynamics of predator and prey, for instance. And the same sorts of dynamical diagrams and phase plots apply to systems like GANs, generative adversarial networks, which are, um, uh, I, you know, I think many of you probably have seen these, uh, the, uh, these, these uh, um, sort of phase hallucination networks have, have actually been described uh, today. Uh, in 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 the ter in the terraforming showcase, um, these are two neural nets, one of which is an artist and the other which is a critic, that are pitted against each other. The artist tries to make convincing faces. The critic tries to figure out, you know, when when what is presented is 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 a real face and when it's a synthetic face, and they kind of ladder up together. Uh, so this is a, an example of a little local intelligence explosion of much the sort that our primate ancestors uh, began undergoing about about seven million years ago, um, and the result in this case is very is very convincing face hallucination. But what I think is often not really understood about GANs is that you know it's really kind of a minimal society of neural nets. It's a society of two, and uh, and the the artist and the critic are have misaligned incentives. Where one of them is trying to fool the other, one of you know, the other one is trying to you know to to figure out when it's uh, when it's uh, when when uh, when it's trying to be fooled, and um, and the 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 way they evolve, the way they co-evolve uh, has these uh, kind of game theoretic uh, dynamics that can have fixed points and spirals and 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 chaos and so on. That's why it's quite difficult to train GANs because you have to sort of fiddle around with them until their dynamics actually converge and settle. So um, so yeah, these kinds of, of phase diagrams, you know, really are illustrations of politics. The politics of, of a two-player game are uh, relatively straightforward, but uh, now imagine the politics of a, a trillion plus 10 billion 
player game. Uh, uh, if we count only uh, humans and little AIs that can uh, that, that have that have language and that are themselves, you know, aligned uh, in terms of their interests uh, with uh, uh, with with their with their makers, which might be corporate, which themselves are also intelligences, of course, um, and are also emergent. Now you start to get a sense of where we of where we're going. So, um, so that's that's sort of uh, my I guess both um, optimistic and pessimistic sense of of where the where the planet is headed. Um, planetary intelligence is the aggregation of um, of what will soon be many 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 uh, small intelligences um, of many scales uh, that are able to interact with natural languages that will be legible to us. Uh, we will be among those actors. Uh, it's hard not to think about all of that uh, in in a light very similar to the way brains uh, emerge out of the interactions of lots and lots of neurons. If spikes are the, the universal code that neurons use to interact with each other, then uh, I'm pretty convinced that language is going to be the universal code that all of those intelligences use to interact with each other. And all of those crazy dynamics that emerge from all of that are uh, you know, much like the, the dynamics that we see uh, within individual brains. And uh, that's why we don't always agree with ourselves. It's why we don't always um, uh, have an undivided mind. Uh, it's why this idea of, of parliament of mind uh, is, is, uh, um, is a popular one. Uh, and I expect to see much the same in, in, um, in what emerges at, at Earth scale uh, for better and for worse. Uh, so I will, I will uh, end it there. Benjamin, I hope that was more or less the right length of time. That was brilliant. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Blaise. We're really, really appreciative of your time, taking your time out of the, out of the day to, to share that with us. It was a um, perfect, perfect pitch, you and Chow, uh, uh, as, a, as a sort of uh, bookend to the series of, of projects that we just saw. So thanks. Thanks very much. We're 